Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's Poppy Science Seminar. Uh, it's my pleasure to be the host for this session. Uh, I'm Mike Gidley, Director of Centre for Nutrition and Food Sciences at the University of Queensland, part of Coffee. Um, and uh, will be, I will be the, the, the mediator for this, meet, for this uh, session. Uh, before we get started, um, just to mention that this, uh, this seminar is scheduled from 12 until 1. And if you uh, want to ask a question, please put it in the, the chat function. Sorry, <laughs> please use the Q&A button, not the chat function, uh, to put your questions. Um, and then um, we will get to them at the end of the seminar. Uh, before we start, though, let's uh, acknowledge the traditional owners uh, and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today, um, pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants, who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. Uh, we recognize their valuable contributions to Australia and global society. So today's speaker is Dr. Heather Schuen from the Department of School of Chemical Engineering here at UQ. Um, Heather obtained her Bachelor of Technology in Food Engineering from Massey University and then worked in the gelatin manufacturing industry uh, for 10 years uh, before seeing the light and joining academia uh, she obtained her PhD from UQ in 2015 uh, and has continued her studies on the relationships between the structure, physical properties and sensory perception of uh, soft particles uh, in food and model systems that she's going to tell us about today. Uh, so to me, this is a really good example of where, where both fundamental science and industry application come together. Uh, and hopefully you will appreciate that as Heather goes through her talk uh, today. So over to you, Heather, uh, and uh, I'll come back at the end and moderate the Q&A session. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, so before we get started, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet, um, their ancestors and their descendants. Um, thank you for having me today. So my talk is about soft particles in our food. Uh, and I have a lot of contributors to this talk. It goes right through from the beginning of my PhD to some a, a lot of work we've done over the last probably um, seven to nine years with industry. So um, particularly Associate Professor Heather Smythe, who's done a lot of the sensory work with uh, Sandra Mantia. Um, and my supervisor throughout this whole time, starting from the beginning of my PhD, which is um, Professor Jason Stokes. So what do I mean when I say foods are a system of soft particles? Um, so you can see from some of these images here, uh, such as mayonnaise, we've got emulsion droplets. So emulsion, stable emulsion droplets can behave as soft particles. Chocolate, um, so we've got some harder particles in chocolate. Uh, particularly sugar crystals um, in irregular shapes uh, dispersed in a fat phase. So how do they behave as, as systems of soft particles? Um, this is an acid milk gel, which is a sort of a model yogurt, so made with acid rather than fermented. And when you stir these, they break up into um, micro gel like domains. So each of these sort of protein domains break up and they perform as a system of soft particles as well. So starting from my PhD though, I wanted a really simple system or relatively simple system. Uh, so I chose agar microgels, which is what's shown in this image here. So the beauty of soft particles is that you can structure them. So based on um, soft matter physics, uh, we can influence the areology. So as we increase the volume of particles present, we increase their viscosity initially, and then as we pack them and they become um, a contact and they start to deform, they become a solid-like suspension. And we'll talk a bit more about that as we go on. The challenge with systems of soft particles, or a challenge, I should say, is that they can contribute to the sensory experience of grittiness. Uh, so I think, everybody can identify with this picture here, which is yogurt and instantly this particle-like sensation that you would get by eating this yogurt on the bottom left here, or any of the bottom three really comes to mind. And that's quite unpleasant. And those um, 
unexpected sensory grittiness perceptions can really influence consumer liking and um, purchase decisions. But it seems most of the literature was product of dependent. Um, so it's often linked to hard particles, as I mentioned before, sugar crystals and chocolate, starch particles and soups or sauces, so um, ones that haven't gelatinized properly, or as you see, see here, these protein aggregates in dairy type products. So can we look at all this based on a fundamental model of soft hydrogel particles? So I've spent an extensive amount of time making these model particles. Um, either from agarose, which makes a nice model system because it, the particles aren't attractive. They're stable, chemically and electrically neutral. Um, they don't shrink and swell with the other ingredients. Um, and I can tune their particle modulus just by changing the, the agarose concentration. Uh, obviously you can't eat agarose, so we also made agar ones when we did the, the sensory trials. Um, they're just a bit more attractive they become attractive particles and we'll see where that becomes a, um, a little bit of a challenge later on. So I make these by adding agarose into sunflower oil, homogenizing it to form a water and oil emulsion where agar or agarose is in the water phase and then gelling those droplets simply by cooling them down. And then as I said, I can change the agar concentration to make softer or harder particles. The challenging part is separating the microgels from the oil phase, which can take a significant amount of time and a lot of centrifuging. Now, the other great thing about these particle systems is that then we can manipulate them at different length scales. Why would we want to do that? And what do I mean by that? So the suspension length scale is where the particles behave in, as a bulk. Um, we can measure that using bulk rheology, such as a vein tool or between parallel plates. Um, it's relevant to first bite type sensations and we've got um, a large volume in your mouth. So thickness, firmness, melting and breakdown be can be some of the sensory percepts associated with this. Uh, then we've got areas in the mouth where the particles become confined, that is they attract or deformed between surfaces. Um, and their micromechanics, suspension micromechanics dominate. So suspension micromechanics is simply the mechanics of the particle, the softness and the size being two key examples. So that can lead to perceptions like creaminess, fattiness, smoothness, grittiness. And then we get into um, the point where our tongue and palate, for example, are in contact or other oral surfaces and surface properties begin to dominate. So then sensory percepts like astringency or roughness uh, become important. So can we really test this using the conceptual model of soft particles, given that we can then control their bulk properties and their micromechanics by controlling the particle mechanics? Um, and then so surface properties, we tend to be able to control that as well using, um, the, using the continuous phase. So first of all, looking at the structured soft matter systems and delving into that a bit more and looking at how these soft matter or food type systems can be, can control the rheology. So in my PhD, I started off with looking at viscosity of hard sphere suspension. So there's an enormous amount of literature on these. Um, there's mostly agreement on the fact that these um, reach this maximum packing fraction. So phi m over here. Um, maximum packing fraction for a um, monodispersed system at a phase volume of around about 0 0.62, 6458. There are some variations. Um, for polydispersed suspensions, we were fortunate that there was a model released not much before my PhD started um, where we could determine the random close packing fraction to replace the maximum packing fraction over here. And this is the Quamada model or Maron PS Quamada model, which I refer to as MPQ. So we use the random close packing fraction in here and that way we don't have to just fit the maximum packing fraction that had been done before. So we suddenly have um, a theoretical basis rather than just using an empirical model, which had pre previously been used by fitting the data. 
So what about soft particle suspensions? How do the hard sphere models apply up to random close packing fraction? And we found that exactly the same model applied to soft particle suspensions as to hard particle suspensions. So it, the viscosity is simply a function of the volume of particles and their particle size distribution dictates this random close packing fraction. So the softness of particles doesn't have any impact on their viscosity. But then when we start to pack them close together um, and they start to deform, that's when the particle modulus or particle softness, so that's, this is particle modulus here, this becomes important in this region above maximum packing fraction. So the harder particles will increase the suspension modulus. Now I mentioned the challenge with free fitting of this um, maron ps Quamada model, which is traditionally done to find the maximum packing fraction for polydispersed suspensions. And the reason for that, that it's so challenging, is that any small errors can lead to a completely different model. But the great thing about this model, um, the maron ps Quamada model, is it has this fixed exponent here of negative two. So then we can linearize it and find much more readily find this intercept, which also is the, we can either use it as free fitting for maximum packing fraction, but it turns out that it's pretty well identical to the random close packing fraction. So very reliably, even though there's a fair amount of error in some of these, or can be a fair amount of error in these measurements. So to summarize all of that, hopefully I haven't lost you, we have dilute suspensions, so their viscosity is largely Newtonian. And as we increase their packing, and we move to the right across this diagram, we increase their viscosity according to, to phase volume and their random close packing fraction to determine this point where the asymptote lies. Above that, we have suspension modulus G prime and G double prime, and that is dependent on particle modulus and phase volume. So increase volume to the right on the x-axis and, uh, and increase in particle modulus increases G prime up this way. So can we apply this to help determine key microstructural drivers for the rheology of food and beverages? So we chose a fairly complex system of chocolate and biscuit cream. So when I say cream in this context, it's not a dairy cream. It's with a, it's a mixture of sugar and shortening. Um, so these are our soft materials. So starting with chocolates, we had four different types with two fat levels, 26 and 29%, from two different processing methods. So a small lab scale method and a mid scale process. And we measured their viscosity as a function of stress. And as expected with molten chocolate, it has a yield stress and shear thinning. Um, so decreasing viscosity with increasing shield stress, with increasing shear stress, sorry. Um, but this didn't, wasn't very meaningful. We expected that the viscosity of the higher, um, the higher fat phase would be lower than the low fat phase. Anyway, with this diagram, we can put it all together. So this linearized version, we can then make it a function of its phase volume. So it doesn't then matter what the fat as a function of the random close packing fraction. fraction. So that takes out the, the differences in fat concentration. And we see that then the, the pair from the small scale process and the pair from the mid scale process are then behaving similarly to within the process, but are not behaving similar to, similarly to each other. So processing affects the degree of aggregated structure. And simply by putting it on this, plotting it in this way against the theoretical hard sphere line, we're able to de determine that degree of aggregation. But we also decided to work out whether that was particle-particle interactions that were driving that um, deviation from the hard sphere line. So we added uh, different amounts of emulsifier, and there's plenty of literature on this showing that as you add more PGPR, 
you decrease the viscosity because you're decreasing the interactions between the hydrophilic sugar particles. And the same thing happens in mixtures of sugar and shortening, so this biscuit cream phase. So that wasn't unexpected. But when we went and put that back on the theoretical line, we found that we'd been able to shift the behavior of the chocolate back to a theoretical hard sphere. So by decreasing those interactions, all of a sudden we have a chocolate that's now behaving like a system of hard spheres, despite the fact that sugar particles aren't perfectly spherical, um, it lines up fairly well. So emulsifier decreases the particle adhesion, we have a hard sphere. And we, this demonstrates that this framework is really successful for analyzing even quite complex foods like chocolates and biscuit creams. We also looked at the tribology of these systems. Um, so we used a PDMS disc and PDMS ball in the MTM mini traction machine. So both of these turn at a slide to roll ratio of 50%. Um, there's a load of two newton on the ball and we used, sorry, that's not 25 degrees. For chocolates, we used 40 degrees. So we looked at the tribology of, of molten chocolate at a range of entrainment speed between ball and disc, and we came up with a friction coefficient. So with from this plot, we can see that with increasing co cocoa butter concentration, we see a decreasing friction coefficient. We were able to put this onto a, uh, able to um, plot this again as a function of the viscosity. And obviously, as it's non Newtonian, it is a bit challenging to determine which viscosity to use. So we use that high shear plateau. From this model and from this um, system, and using a model developed again with model systems in the tribometer, we now know that. This deviation here is simply due to shear thinning, so that's aggregate break, breakup. And the point where it joins the theoretical um, hydrodynamic region is due to decreasing particle aggregation. So again, because we understand the model, the system from a fundamental point of view, so both, both the measurement system and the particle system, then we're better able to interpret the tribological results. Now, how do these this lead to, to grittiness? Well, we haven't done it on chocolate, but we've looked at particle detectability in mouth, again, for model systems. So from the particle sensory detection literature, there's quite a lot showing that size increases detectability, as you'd expect. Um, less spherical particles are more detectable. Harder particles are more detectable. Also, again, you'd expect that. And the one that there's a bit of conjecture around is the viscosity of the medium. So some publications suggest that this increasing the viscosity of the continuous phase decreases your detectability, so effectively masks the presence of particles. There's some literature that, that contradicts that. And so we set out to, to find out, one, what do we mean by hard particles increase detectability? So is there, are there some thresholds in there? And um, does viscosity, changing the viscosity of the medium really mask those particles, but or in what range? We know that all these factors are interrelated. So again, the soft particle agar model became useful. So we used agar microgels at three, five, and 10 weight percent uh, dispersed in water uh, at con nominal concentrations of 10, 50, and 80 weight percent. So the aim was to get these um, viscosity against shear stress reasonably closely matched in three ranges. So we had non-Newtonian shear thinning and a system with a yield stress. So we had um, different matrix phase, uh, glucose with dextrin to give us this Newtonian system, xanthin with de dextrin to give a non-Newtonian system, and we used yogurts and we diluted them with milk in some cases to make up for adding the, the microgels. So in this effective matrix phase, all of the nominal concentration for the microgels was all at 10% um, initially, and we also used changing concentrations to look at threshold perception. 
So again, use the same model system, this time just with agar. Uh, we did attempt to separate these out by size. Unfortunately, model soft particles don't work all that well um, when you try and sieve them out by size. They all seem to stick together. Um, so we ended up with the same size distribution or very similar size distribution for the three modulus particles. Um, that gave us an interesting result and actually helped us uh, match, um, find out more about the effect of modulus on the perceived size of particles in mouth we'll talk about shortly. So we did instrumental rheology, suspension rheology just in a standard rotational rheometer between parallel plates. You have to use parallel plates here because of the size of the particles. And also looked at the modulus of an agar gel disc to, to give us a nominal modulus for the agar microgel particles. So made it the same agar concentration. So we had agar concentrations of 3, 5, and 10%, which relates to 120, 210, and 520 kilopascal modulus estimate for the particle. So we used a sensory descriptive analysis um, with a panel of 12 trained assessors going through training sessions where we brainstormed the attributes, developed a lexicon, method of assessment, a set of reference standards and a method of presentation that suited the assessors and the samples. Um, we did practice sessions and formal evaluation with three replicates. Um, just a note here that we used apple to clear our palate because agar particles tend to hang around in the mouth and your throat and they're quite difficult to get rid of. But apple and banana are actually are the two things that get rid of it. We also did a triangle test, set of triangle tests um, with 24 assessors. And we had each triangle uh, test consisted of one serving with microgels and two servings without. And we looked for differences. So where the, the panel said, yes, there's a this this one is correctly identified one as being different. And a set where um sorry, and um, discrimination, which is where they can determine why it's different, identify why. So using the knowledge that I just, just discussed in the first section about viscosity of microgel suspensions, I was able to tune these reasonably well um, to give us two sets. So with 50% microgels, we end up with um, almost Newtonian, maybe slightly shear thinning behavior of a set that's fairly well matched for the high modulus, so the hardest particles, medium and low modulus. Um, not so well matched for the 80% microgel particles. As I mentioned earlier, the agar particles interact with each other. Um, so we see a slight change in yield stress and a, a lower high shear viscosity for the softest particles compared to the highest ones. We also controlled the viscosity here on the right using um, the Novagel matrix, which is a mixture of microcrystalline cellulose and carboxymethyl cellulose, um, and kept the microgel particles at 10% in, these, in this matrix. So this is where we did sensory descriptive analysis. And we found that with increasing, they, they trended to the right with increasing modulus of particles and the same for the, the lower microgel concentration. So thickness, lingering and cloying are dominated by suspension viscosity. Chalkiness and size of particles are dominated by particle modulus. And smoothness is influenced by both particle modulus and viscosity of the system. So looking at the effect of the matrix phase with the second set of samples, mouth coating, drying, teeth stick, um, clearance, thickness and cloying are all dominated by the matrix phase viscosity. Chalkiness and size of particles again is dominated by particle modulus, so it's good that we're getting consistent result. And again, smoothness is influenced by both modulus and viscosity. So first of all, looking at thickness in a bit more detail. So thickness, sensory thickness perception is simply a function of viscosity. And it was really nice to be able to clarify that it's completely independent of particle modulus, even if it's the particles that are driving that thickness perception. 
smoothness perception on the other hand, and this is smoothness score on the left and as a function of agar concentration on the right, that only weakly correlates with viscosity. So we look at this plot here against smoothness score. We've chosen viscosity at five reciprocal seconds um, because the lower shear rates in the mouth had a, had a better um, correlation with the sensory score. Um, I could show you the whole range, but it's much simpler just to show one shear rate. But you can't really see any particular correlation here with smoothness. So then we had a look at low, medium and high particle modulus and tried to draw whether there were co correlations. And again, it's only three samples in each set in this case. So looking at smoothness score again with these lines here, now we can see that low and medium particles give a fairly similar smoothness score that increases with viscosity of the system. And when we add hard, the harder particles, the high modulus particles, that offsets the smoothness score. So now we know that there's two separate um, contributors and we're able to differentiate them using this model system. And that hasn't been shown before. So just summarizing the two sets together, and this is in the um, with the controlled matrix phase, so where the particles are all at a 10 weight percent concentration with the Nova gel controlling the viscosity. So the thickness with the three different sets of particles pretty much collapses onto it. Um, they collapse onto each other. But again, we see this, this offset. So the other thing we did in this study was we asked the panelists to say, can they detect the particles, yes or no, um, as well as the degree of perception if they said yes. So it was really easy to separate these out into groups. We have the high modulus particles that are detected by most panelists, no matter what the viscosity or the continuous phase is composed of. It doesn't change very much between samples. Low modulus particles, so this is our um, 3% agar, they weren't detected by the vast majority of panelists except in one case. Again, regardless of viscosity. And then we have this set in the middle, oops, which didn't come up, um, which we uh, call moderately detectable particles, um, where some could be detected and some couldn't. Sorry, I have got another slide. Um, so also another point that sensory size of particles is a function of particle modulus. So um, because we had all the same particle size distribution, this ended up working in our favor. So the sensory perception is independent of the actual size of particles. It's really controlled by modulus in this particular sample set. So particle concentration becomes important then for detectable particles at a medium and high modulus. But where they can't detect them, um, none of the concentrations that we looked at, so even up to 80% volume, you still they still couldn't detect the softest particles as individual particles. Okay, this is the graph I was looking for. Um, so in this middle range, we don't see any clear trend of detectability as a function of viscosity in the sample set. So these are not in any particular order down here. Um, but based on literature, we thought that particles would become increasingly difficult to detect with an increasing matrix phase viscosity. So this is where we did the triangle tests. So we used mixtures of xanthan and dextrin dispersed in milk to viscosify, um, gradually increasing the viscous phase. So from XD1, which is the lowest viscosity, up to XD3, which has a relatively high viscosity and very shear thinning. So differences between the three sets are approximately two orders of magnitude at low shear stress. Of course, different smaller differences at high shear stresses because of the shear thinning nature of xanthan gum. And we had 24 consumers. They didn't show any difference in the concentration at which they could de sensory detection threshold or recognition threshold. So all of these are the same regardless of the viscosity. So we were a bit surprised. So we then did it again, this time in yogurt. So uh, 
yielding fluid xanthan dextran so more of a shear thinning fluid and our glucose dextran so again newtonian and even with these extreme um, differences in viscosity we again didn't see any differences in the detection or the recognition threshold so this is four orders of magnitude different in low shear viscosity so we, we've effectively disproved our hypothesis that these um, semi-detectable particles so from the mid-range they're not the um, high modulus detectable particles and they're not the low modulus particles that no one can detect so they're in that middle range um, they're actually changing the viscosity won't alter their detectability and that brings me to the end of my talk so through systematic variation of particle modulus particle concentration and matrix phase viscosity uh, this work as a whole has provided useful design parameters for foods containing particles or those that put, form particles in the mouth. Um, we can control the rheology and the tribology based on particle volume and, and aggregation, which also impacts volume. So increasing particle volume increases the viscosity up to the random closed packing fraction. Uh, above that, modulus and particle volume both increase the overall suspension modulus and become more solid like. So increases in aggregation and decre decreases in shear thinning through stronger particle particle interactions increase the friction. And drivers for grittiness perception, we've shown a huge effect of modulus. Sorry, my lights are turning off. Um, and uh, with increasing particle modulus, particles become increasingly detectable in mouth, and that uh, particle modulus dominates our detectability over um, the effects of viscosity in that partially detectable regime. So our results then disprove our hypothesis that partially detectable particles would be increasingly dif difficult to detect with increasing viscosity of the of the matrix phase and that starts to shed some light on the existing literature and the conflicts in there so a huge thank you to um so first funding from the australian government for my apa scholarship for my phd um Fonterra cooperative who've funded a lot of the fundamental work and um relevant work for them in-house um including the ARC linkage grant uh, towards rational food structure design. The chocolate work was funded by Mondelez International. And I'd just like to recognize the key people who I've worked with throughout this time, particularly Jason Stokes, Heather Smythe, and Sandra olate Mantia. So thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A function. Uh, no one's been brave enough yet, but plenty of time. I'll, I'll ask a couple of, of questions to get the discussion started, and then you can please put in your questions uh, through the Q&A section. Uh, so, uh, Heather, a, a few sort of points occurred to me during the talk. One, one thing that, that piqued my interest is that um, in, in terms of the particle shape, you were saying that the model was actually pretty forgiving for uh, moving to sugar crystals, which are definitely not spherical as <laughs> using agar as a model. So ha have you explored further how forgiving that model is and, and really does shape even matter uh, when it comes to uh, generalized behaviors of hard particles? Um, we haven't really explored it. Um, shape does matter in terms of sensory perception. There's some pretty clear literature in that area in terms of if you've got um, sharp particles, they're much more detectable. In terms of their rheology, and we know that elongated particles are much more shear thinning. So at low shear rates, which is where I'm really comparing things in a lot of this work, probably less effect. It's much more on their volume, but at high shear rates, you're going to see much more shear thinning behavior. And so that will alter their rheology in use and their, and their sensory perception. But, uh, but I guess the um, the theory at the moment is only for spherical particles. The theory can't be extended further than that. Um, no, there's people who are trying, although we haven't delved into that side of things. 
Okay. Uh, so a question from Bernadine. So um, although the hard modulus particles uh, were perceived, were they equally disliked um, in as a function of the viscosity? So in other words, uh, although you can perceive them, does that mean does viscosity affect the the degree of liking or the tolerance for uh, for hard for particles to be perceived? We didn't actually ask that question. That's a very good question. Um, so we didn't study that with the panelists in terms of liking of of the systems where we altered the viscous phase. Um, my my suggestion would be I don't imagine so because they were equally perceived. I could still there was no change in sensation that I could accurately identify. <laughs> okay, so so the principle seem so the, the principle is that the if you can detect hard particles, you assume that that leads to a negative response in the general consumer. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So are there any cases where actually you you want that? particle detection or is it always a case of wanting to avoid it? Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, it's it's unexpected grittiness that leads to poor consumer perception. So I guess there might be situations where you've added, um, I think of popping canning as a really extreme example, I actually want that perception in there. Um, perhaps not such a grittiness perception. You may want it in there in terms of some of the fruit additives. You know, if people know that there's going to be um, a berry, a seed-like sensation in there, that means you've actually put fruit in. So those are the sort of um, scenarios I can think of where you want it in there. So my, my final question is, is around um, how soft you can go. So I think the lowest you did was 1% agar, which is still a decent gel. It's still a, a clear macroscopic gel if you make it like that. But many of the particles in, in our foods are much uh, even softer than that. So I'm thinking of gelatinized starches, things like that, where uh, they're still particulate, but are another, another level down in softness. So how soft can you go with this approach or how relevant is it to go to softer particles where perhaps the level of surface deformability is going to get much higher. Good question. Um, so the softest I've made using agar was half a percent. So really we can go, um, it just depends on the on the type of um, hydrocolloid that we've used or, or we could study starch using it. Um, it was just a matter of getting discrete particles for the work that I was doing. But there's no, I don't think there's any, um, the limit would be become, would be where they stop behaving as particles, that they're so soft and so deformable that they become more polymer-like is really um, the limit of the model. Okay, thank you so much. I'm uh, not seeing any further questions, so I think we'll call that to a halt. Um, I, I just need to, if you could move the slide on, Heather, just to tell there people around uh, the uh, arrangements for next week as well. Okay. <laughs> so next week, um, we have uh, a Boffy Science Seminar at the same time is by Dr. Li Chi Han uh, on digital twins uh, for optimization of, of orchard spray particles, very different subject. Um, and uh, this talk has been recorded. Um, so if you missed it or if you want to let someone else know what a great talk they missed, then uh, there will be a link coming out uh, before the end of the week. Um, if you want to have make some feedback or, or offer your services to present a Quaffy Science Seminar, uh, then there is a, a website, uh, or you can contact Craig Hardner, who is the, uh, who's the committee coordinator. Uh, we're always looking for uh, good uh, science seminars that you don't have to be from within Quaffy, as Heather has proved today. Uh, anything in the realms of agriculture and food, we're really interested in hearing what you've been up to, um, and please contact us and put your name forward to present a seminar. So with that, I think I'll draw it to a close and say thank you to everyone. And thank you particularly to Heather for a, a really interesting and stimulating presentation. Thank you, Heather.